Hey everyone, welcome to lecture six. Uh, this is a three-parter. The first is going to be about um, context, and then the second will be Rembrandt calls, and then the third will be all the rest. We are going to be talking about the Netherlands today, the lowlands, the low countries. They have a bunch of different names. Holland. And I want to tell you about three different historical events that occurred in the Netherlands during the 1600s um, that affected their economy, which then affected uh, the way that they purchased art and the art that they purchased. So the first thing is we need to talk about the slave trade. So it was illegal to have a slave in the Netherlands, but it was not illegal to participate in the giant shipping industry of the slave trade, which is absolutely horrific. And I'm sure you've learned about it in American history. It helped support the economy, and in 1619, the Netherlands took the lead in building the large-scale slave trade between Africa and Virginia. That's that triangular trade. And by 1650, they became the preeminent slave trading country in Europe. So even though they outlawed slavery in the Netherlands, their hands were absolutely not clean. In fact, they were one of the major contributors of the slave trade. Another interesting thing that happened in the Netherlands was this thing called tulip mania. It was a period during the Dutch Golden Age, which is what we call this kind of the 1600s in, in the Netherlands, during which prices for some bulbs of recently introduced and fashionable tulips reached extraordinarily high levels and then dramatically collapsed in February of 1637. And it's considered the first speculative bubble, like the dot-com bubble or the real estate bubble that you might be more familiar with. It was the tulip bubble. Basically, what happened was people thought that specific types of tulips would become very valuable, and so they bought futures of the tulips, and then nobody wanted those tulips because they're like, why would I spend $5,000 on a flower? Although they were doing that. So, And then once the idea of people buying them fell through, then the entire market collapsed. And so this was this was the first example of this kind of like marketplace destroying an entire economy. The last historical event I want to talk about is the Glorious Revolution, which was not in the Netherlands, but it was in England. So what happened was the English didn't want, they had a, a Catholic ruler. We talked about Flanders last time. We talked about Van Dyck and how they had this um, struggle between Catholicism and pro Protestantism. And what they did was they invited the Stadtholder of the Netherlands. That just means like sort of the ruler of the Netherlands to come over and invade England. And they, he would be welcome, and he was. They really didn't stop him from invading England because they wanted to get rid of James II, who was a Catholic king. And this cemented the par parliamentary rule in England and that they would be a Protestant country forevermore. James fled to France, and then William and his wife Mary uh, ruled as co-monarchs. Mary, incidentally, was the daughter of James II, so she had a rightful sort of um, claim to the throne. By having this connection now between England and the Netherlands, they became critical allies to each other, and they both were fighting with Louis XIV of France, and we will talk about him when we get to the Baroque period in France. So the Netherlands are free of Spanish rule, but now they're fighting another Catholic king, Louis XIV. It's fine, by the way, if you don't understand any of this. What I'm trying to point out to you is that there was money in the Netherlands, and this money needed a place to go, and art was one of those places. And they approached art differently than the Catholic countries. And we will talk about why and how in this lecture. Okay, so here's our timeline of artworks. The ones in the yellow are things that we've already looked at, Caravaggio, Rubens, Van Dyck, Velasquez. The stuff in the blue is what we're looking at in this first part. We're really only looking at two artists in this first part, Franz Halls and Rembrandt. And we're looking at them specifically because they do the same thing, but in kind of different ways. And if you don't know where the Netherlands are, I provided this trusty map. Uh, the Netherlands are up there, kind of sandwiched between Germany and Belgium, and across from England. And you can see why now England invited a ruler who just had to cross the English Channel there, the North Sea, to take over. All right, so here's kind of a breakdown of Holland itself. 
it was mostly Reformed Protestants. They didn't really have many religious commissions because their churches were not covered in art like in the Catholic churches. In fact, they were very sparse, and it was supposed to be all about you know, focusing on thinking about God. Elected officials ruled. They didn't really have royal courts. So when I say William III was the Stadtholder, I mean he wasn't really the king. He was more like a president. The public developed an appetite for paintings, and this is, goes kind of with this tulip mania thing, in which demand for a specific product increased. Then you needed artists to make those paintings, and so there was a lot of artists that went up to the Netherlands, or we talked about Spain, and I said a lot of art was purchased by the, the Dutch that lived in Spain at the time because they, they used it to decorate their houses, and this lecture will explain why they wanted to decorate their houses with art. Typical subjects that you would find in a Dutch Baroque painting would be uh, nature, daily life, which is just scenes of people sort of being people, balanced compositions, less intense color, a clear natural light. Now we will see tenebrism and chiaroscuro because they were affected by um, Caravaggio, but we're going to see it used in a different way, not for religious purposes, but for other purposes. This slide shows us like a spectrum of how paintings were seen in order of importance. So the most important paintings were history paintings, and it didn't necessarily mean that they had to be about like a historical event. They could be about his, um, a biblical story or a mythological scene, but like a lot of work and effort to kind of tell a story from the past. And then below that are portraits, royalty being the most important, but as we'll see in these Dutch paintings, you could have just been like a city leader or somebody with great wealth, and you would have commissioned a portrait. Below that are genre scenes. Now this is, this can get confusing because we use the word genre when we talk about like a type of thing, like the, what is the genre of that music or whatever. So in this sense, genre scene is a type of genre or a, or a type. And a genre scene is, is generally like everyday life, like a woman peeling potatoes or people dancing to some sort of musical composition or something. So genre scenes are basically just everyday life. And then you have landscape paintings, like seascapes or cityscapes. Below that, you have paintings of animals. We will talk about, well, I guess we talked a little bit about an animal painting before right, with Rubens and that eagle. And so that painter would have just made paintings of animals. And then on the bottom are still lifes. And a still life is just like flowers or food, like Mr. Salad in Caravaggio, where you just have a painting of something you would see on a table. But we'll talk about why those are important too in this lecture. So um, there was an art market in the Netherlands, and painters made paintings, and then they had to sell them. So unlike um, in those Catholic countries where you would be commissioned, to, to make a painting, this was, they were, they were making what they thought people wanted and then they would sell them. So people would go to, you know, a studio and go, I like this one and I'll take it. So it was kind of a, a reverse of what was happening in the Catholic countries in which the church was commissioning paintings. And this, it's very similar today, where an artist makes what they think the public wants and then the public comes to them and buys them. In this lecture, we're going to talk about group portraits, and we're going to talk about how they were put together, and how they were paid for, and how they were paid for actually determined how they were put together. And I know that sounds cuckoo, but as soon as we look at it, you'll understand what I'm saying. All right, so why were things different in the Netherlands as opposed to those Catholic countries? And that had a lot to do with John Calvin and his influence on, on Holland. And... We talked a bit about the Catholics believe that if you do something good, then you can get into heaven, or if you pay indulgences, then you can get into heaven. But the Calvinists believe that, no, uh, just read the Bible and, and have faith, and you'll get into heaven. And they were also iconoclasts, which meant that like they didn't really like having too many images or relics or statues, because they were afraid that you might mistake the image for the actual thing. And so if you just created a mental picture that was more pure than if you were staring at a statue of Mary. Now the big deal with John Calvin was that he came up with this idea of predestination. 
This meant that it didn't matter what you did, you were either going to heaven or you weren't, and it was decided even before you were born. It wasn't up to you. You were powerless in determining this. And by having this a part of Calvinism, you then take away the entire power of the Catholic Church because they threaten people with excommunication or they tell you these are the ways to get into heaven. And Calvin says, nope, you're either going or you're not going. There's nothing you can do. So then the next question is, well, why not be horrible if you're going to go to heaven? You know, what does it matter if I do good things or bad things? So the question was, was there a way to know if you were going to heaven? Initially, no, but when you combine the marketplace with this capitalism, with this idea of predestination, then something starts to come out, and that is economic success becomes a sign of God's grace. So, the, so to answer the question, why not do bad things if I'm going to go to heaven or not, is if you do bad things, that's probably a sign you're not going to heaven. But if you do good things and you are wealthy, then you're probably going to heaven. So success was a sign of salvation. And if this sounds familiar to you, like rich people are good and poor people are bad, it's because Calvinism was exported to the United States. And in the United States, we do have this idea of if you're wealthy, that means you must have done something right. And so that idea of showing wealth as a symbol that you are predestined to go to heaven pervades life in Holland. But they had like a caveat to that, and it was, don't be like ostentatious with your wealth, because that is like vanity. And vanity is bad, a sin, and you will go to hell for that. So you have to be inconspicuously wealthy. And what I mean is like, you have to be subtle in your wealth. And so this painting that I'm showing you, like why we're looking at this, is because it's a still life. It looks like maybe the end of a party or something where things are knocked over and the tablecloth is askew and there are things that look like they have been half eaten. But it's all very fancy stuff. And the, the fruit shows wealth, like having the ability to have a lemon um, or tobacco or... All of these things, these are subtle hints of wealth, but also because of their arrangement, they show how life is fleeting as well. So don't get sort of hooked on the pleasures of life because life ends. But also the fact that you're rich enough to buy all these things shows that you're probably going to heaven. So there's this fine line of be wealthy, but don't brag about it. And that's a, an outward sign that you're going to heaven. And other people will see that as a sign that you're going to heaven. And they might treat you differently. All right, so we'll leave it there. And then the next part, we'll talk about how this idea of predestination played out in the works of art that we see in the Netherlands.